This is all also going to be transmitted by Orfo TV Globo as well. I hope that um, you'll be interactive and post some questions in the chat section uh, for the faculty as we hope to have some discussion after this. I'll now hand over, however, to Satish Kuti and Petros Boskianis, who have really been in instrumental in organising this evening's presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dominic, and welcome to the new iteration of our BHS uh, midweek webinar series, which has now become global. Uh, we welcome uh, a very famous Greek colleagues who are joining us today, and I'd like to uh, thank them for taking their time out to join us in this webinar. Um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions at the end. Please do post them in the chat, and we can uh, come back to that at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, my colleague, uh, Petros, who's been inter instrumental in getting these, this lineup of phenomenal speakers to join us this evening. Petros, over to you. Thank you very much, Atish, and thank you for joining us today. Our first speaker is Professor Panayotis Papagelopoulos, who is the professor and chairman of orthopedic surgery at the first uh, department of orthopedic surgery in Athens and the director of Panayotis Sakakos Orthopedic Research and Education Center. He is the chief of the orthopedic oncology unit at uh, Atkin General Hospital in Athens, the past president of the International Society of Limb Salvage and past president of the Hellenic Association of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology as well as the European Musculoskeletal Oncology Society, who's going to talk to us uh, about the work of Professor Hartefield Achilles. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation. Uh, thanks uh, to the president and also to the moderators. And uh, I will share with you a few words and uh, thoughts about uh, a great person named George Hartofilakidis. I will start uh, with this, Nanus Gigadum Meris Inside, which means that uh, the dwarfs are standing on the shoulders of the giants. And um, is something that a uh, long time ago has uh, described in the 11th century. And as you can see here in this uh, painting, uh, the giant Orion, which is uh, blind, uh, uh, searching for the rising sun, has on the shoulders uh, his um, uh, draft. We are like drafts sitting on the shoulder of giants, and we see more in things that are more distant than they did, not because our sight is superior now, but because they are taller, we are taller than they, but because they raise up as to be at the great statue to add to ours. So this happened uh, in the Athens University. Uh, in the last um, uh, century, you can see that the Athens University started uh, at the beginning of the century, of the 20th century, with Professor Chrysos Pathis, Professor Kodar Giris, Professor Jan Arfalidis, Professor George Hartofilakidis, who actually was for 25 years chair of this department in different hospitals, Professor Padazopoulos, Stamos, Fragiadakis, Sukakos, Zubos, up to 2011. And uh, within Out this... apologies, I still see your front slide. I'm not sure about others. Perhaps you could go to um, presentation mode and advance your slides. So now what do you see? I share with you, can, can you see working. the... It's working. It, I think so. Now? It's perfectly all right, I think. Thank you. Now you can see? Yes, thank you. So as I said, uh, within all this period, uh, Professor Hartofilakidis was a professor for 25 years. I don't think that any, uh, uh, in any other department uh, they had a chair, at least uh, in Athens or in Greece. He's the, he had in the longest period uh, being as a chairman of the department and actually in an era that the orthopedic surgery had a great evolution. We, we think about uh, George Hartofilakidis to be a giant of orthopedic surgery in Greece. A uh, few words about his uh, biography. He was born in 1927. He had the medical diploma at the Athens University in 1955. 
the PhD in 1960s. He went to, to Cornell in New York for his uh, graduation uh, training, and uh, he was associate professor of orthopedics in 1965. In 1969, he was uh, elected as full professor of orthopedics at the Athens University and also chairman of the department, which at that time was at the hospital of Lycon. He moved the hospital to a brand new hospital, CAT Hospital uh, in Athens in 1969. And in 1974, he was the dean of the Athens Medical School, member of the Senate uh, of the Athens University in 1976, founder of the Orthopedic Research Center of Garofalidis uh, at the CAT Hospital in 1978. In 1984, he was the first president of the Hellenic College of Orthopedic Surgeons, and uh, he retired in 1994 from the university as a emeritus uh, professor. However, as uh, you can see in his biography later, he never retired uh, really. In, 19, in 2019, he got the effort, the European uh, Federation of Orthopedic Surgery Traumatology Society's recognition award for his contribution uh, in orthopedics. All we know, these three, this is the three orthopedics that uh, is uh, quite curved and needs uh, support, but uh, the tree of the Athens uh, University Department of Orthopedics was quite strong, quite uh, productive, fruitful. Uh, as you can see, Professor Hartofilakidis uh, had the opportunity to have students that about uh, 25 of them became full professors now, and not only in Athens, but also in other universities uh, in Greece. Yeah, in 1993, I was very glad to have uh, Professor uh, Hartofilakidis at the time. I was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic. You see Professor Cabanella and Professor Mori invite him uh, to be visiting professor at Mayo Clinic. And he described the well-known uh, globally now classification of the uh, congenital uh, hip dysplasia or development uh, hip dysplasia. Uh, and was so well received uh, his uh, classification at the time. He got many recognitions, as I said. He was, uh, as I would say, the pure eternal of orthopedics. Uh, uh, forever young, up to uh, the last days, he was very active, being in seminars, being in, as a teacher, uh, uh, writing papers, publications. Uh, here you can see him as a scientific director at the Polyclinic uh, Olympic uh, Village during the Olympic Games of 2004. He was very proud uh, about these uh, archives. He has uh, medical records of all these patients that has been operated by him at the department, especially uh, with congenital hip disease. Uh, you can see here some of, um, of these x-rays uh, he presented in a last meeting a few years ago before his death. Uh, I think it was this is in 2019, uh, 45 years uh, follow-up of Charlie prosthesis uh, operated uh, by him. And uh, he started, as I said, uh, describing the techniques of reconstruction for uh, total hip arthroplasty in congenital uh, hip uh, disease since the uh, 80s. And uh, one of the last ones was in 2019. Uh, you see this paper about long-term outcome of cemented channel prosthesis. Uh, his uh, fellows, uh, as uh, uh, Theologos Ioannidis, uh, Costa Stamos, uh, Theophilos Karahalios, uh, George Babis, uh, wrote a lot of paper with him, papers with him uh, regarding all this uh, great experience, and they will discuss this uh, later. But also he has uh, great love, not only for medicine, he had very good friends, he liked enjoying life, his uh, lovely wife, uh, Anna, his kids, Constantinos and Maria, and... Um, as uh, you can see here, uh, uh, he had a great also love about music and he was a great pianist. For us, uh, George Hartofilakidis is uh, the legend, a legend not, not only for the Department of Orthopedics in Athens, but uh, also for all the orthopedics uh, in Greece. And um, as uh, uh, he described, and I have his uh, own words, uh, during the ceremony that we did in 2017, he was 90 years old at that time. Uh, I will uh, say to you the last words of his uh, talk. And as I step down from the podium, let me give 
One last piece of advice to the young doctors who complain, and rightly so, about lack of time. With a good method, with a good planning, time will be found. It will be found for patients who need us, for study, for conferences, time for fun. A Chinese proverb says, God values those who work and loves those who sing. And most importantly, time must be found for the family. Because if we success in science and we lose the family, we will have failed. So this was George Hatofilakidis, a real a legend for all of us. And um, uh, I will be uh, very happy to, to hear uh, my good fellows here, Professor uh, Theophilus Karahalios, uh, Professor uh, Babis and Professor Maheras, uh, to discuss about all this experience that started uh, 30 and more years ago uh, at the Athens University. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Papagilopoulos, for this uh, lovely memoriam for the late Professor uh, George Hardofilakidis. I want to say that questions will be uh, had uh, at, uh, through the chat at the end of these uh, presentations, and uh, none of the speakers at today's webinar have declared um, any uh, disclosures in relation to these talks. Our first um, uh, talk on the reconstruction options uh, for developmental dysplasia concerned the acetabulum and will be given by Professor Theophilos Karahalios, who is a professor and chairman at the Department of Orthopedics at the uh, University General Hospital of Laris in Greece. Uh, he's a specialist in endo reconstructive surgery and a dean of the School of Health Sciences at the local university. He's currently EFORT's first vice president and has been vice president and an external panel of advisors for implants and in vivo diagnostics for the European Commission. He is a past president of the Hellenic Association of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology. Professor Karahalios. Please unmute. Theophile Anixe, please open your microphone. Sorry for this. I would like to ask you to thank you to thank Mr. Boscainos very much for the kind invitation. I also like to thank the uh, British uh, Hip Society. Uh, for their decision for presenting all this. Now, uh, my topic is acetabular reconstruction. Good evening to all. You're on mute again. Uh, I will present you in brief uh, the uh, anatomy the dif in the different types of the disease. I will show you that the restoration of hip center of rotation is very important. Uh, brief comments on the soft tissue releases and lengthening, acetabular reconstruction techniques, and the results from the old series of Cartophilakides and my new series. Now, dysplasia. Uh, low dislocation and high dislocation are different animals. We have already uh, described the local uh, bone abnormalities. There are three different types of the disease. And later, uh, later on, George Babis uh, presented several variants of the low dislocation, those with extended coverage and those with limited coverage. And also for high dislocation, those for a false acetabulum and without false acetabulum. All of them, they have got uh, uh, different problems that you are called to uh, sort out during operation. I would like, uh, I would like also to mention that in our cases, the 20% of them, they have got a longer femoral bone, the ipsilateral ones, and there is a smaller percentage, 10 to 15%, that they have got uh, an ipsilateral valgus any deformity. And it's worth of mentioning that there is an issue with the pelvic obliquity and tilt. Sometimes the hemipelvis is asymmetric with excessive adversion of the acetabulum and posterior column bone, uh, bone uh, stock. The anterior part of the joint is uh, deficient. 
And of course, there is length length discrepancy. Now, when we treat uh, these uh, patients with a uh, total hypoarthroplasty, we start with a thorough preoperative planning. We ask a 3D CT scan, 3D CT scan, in order to evaluate the acetabular bone deficiencies and the dimensions. I would like to notice that uh, these acetabula are quite small. And we perform a scanogram in order to evaluate a length of both uh, femurs. In the next step, uh, we have to assess for superior sigmental deficiency, as it's seen in dysplasia and low dislocation, and superior and anterior and posterior sigmental deficiency, which is found in low dislocation and high dislocation. In this way, you can show if there uh, are problems with uh, acetabular cap coverage. We suggest that you have to restore the anatomic center of rotation. Uh, you have to implant your cap in the true acetabulum because, because the bone stock is better there and for uh, improving hip biomechanics. And uh, my comment is that fixed pelvic uh, deformity recovers later on. However, there are some colleagues that they advocate the placement of the cap in the uh, false acetabulum. Uh, for uh, uh, for managing the pelvic deformity. I don't think that this is correct, and I show you a very bad example. MIS uh, hip surgery, high hip uh, placement, high, hi high acetabular cap placement in an area with inadequate bone stock, early failure, and the patient underwent a complex revision surgery. We also stress that the surgical technique by means of soft tissue releases is more important than the osteotomies. How I do this? Through a posterior approach, I proceed with a step-by-step -step 360 degrees of soft tissue releases, especially for low and high dislocation. We start with adductors release, gluteus maximum release, posterior and superior capsular release, and anterior capsular release from the trochanteric region. This facilitates the recognition of the false acetabulum with the green uh, cycle and the true acetabulum within the uh, yellow cycle. Then we proceed with the options for acetabular reconstruction. Uh, in cases of dysplasia, there is a superior segmental deficiency. Uh, it is easy to find the anatomic center of rotation and you can use ordinary implants. Be aware of cap opening. Now, there is another option, the 15 degrees phase changing caps. This cap was developed by my old friend Everett Smith in uh, Bristol. Now, for low and high dislocation, another option is the high hip uh, placement. Uh, however, the, the clinical results are inconsistent. Uh, another option for the A and B low dislocation with superior and minor posterior segmental deficiency, the option is uh, augmentation with structural auto or allograft. However, again, midterm uh, high, high failure rate has been uh, reported. This technique is coming back, and we in our days we know that the determinants of graph survival are dependent on the location, the morphology, the type of fixation, and especially the mechanical loading of the graft. In our days, in our department, uh, we accept a cap coverage of 75 to 80% in cases of low and high dislocation. Uh, the interface is stable, and the reason is the high friction coefficient of the modern TM implants, trabecular metal caps. In the case that uh, this 75 to 80 percent coverage is not feasible, we proceed with the cotyloplasty, the modern modification, and control med medialization. In the literature, you can see several variants of these techniques depending on the graft morphology, type of fixation, and degree of displacement. In the old days, with Professor Hardophilakidis, what we were doing, we were performing the cotyloplasty. This is a fracture of the medial wall. Control medialization, more cellized autograft, I repeat, autograft from the head, plus the old cemented implants, the offset bore implants. This is another variant of this technique. I performed this case in mid 90s. 
uh, you can see with arrow the um, medial wall uh, transverse fracture. What I would like to say to you is that the, the role of the inner periosteal layer of the medial wall in such reconstruction is very, very important. It's very osteogenic, especially in combination with the femoral, femoral head autograph. And we have reported the old technique, satisfactory long-term results. I saw a case with 80, uh, 28 years follow-up. Of course, there is a problem with the old polyethylene, but as you see in the arrow, with the arrow, uh, that the, uh, there was a reconstruction of the bone stock in the medial wall. Now, in the old days, there was a problem with the small dimensions, and um, uh, Professor Hadofilakidis was using the offset board caps. They were specially made for this. Uh, there was a high failure rate. It, we have proposed this, but the modern uh, small TM caps, either the uh, monoblock, as this uh, one that you see in the picture with 21 years follow-up, or the modern, the modular ones, I think that they are implants uh, game changers. And I show you a modern reconstruction with a high dislocation, the, the yellow arrows, double osteotomies, and so on. The, the relocation of the hip in these cases is a little bit difficult. I, I think that uh, Bob is later on and uh, George Macheras will show, will comment on this. I don't want the overlap. Now, if you look at the old series of Cardophilakidis, the overall survival for low dislocation was approximately 80% and for high dislocation, 80%. And we had noticed uh, during this period of time that acetabular component uh, did better in superior in, in, uh, in hip dislocation and the femoral component did better in low dislocation. We have recently uh, reviewed our series 2000-2010 uh, uh, with 13 to 23 years follow-up, 418 congenital hip joints, 101 low dislocations, 87 high dislocations. All surgeries were performed with TM implants for the acetabular side and the short conical stems, the, uh, the, the, very, the Wagner-like type of implants. And we are able to report a 100% survival for both the low dislocation, high dislocation, with a revision for a septic loosening as an end point. That means uh, in all these cases, we have uh, sorted the, uh, uh, the fixation issue. However, uh, survival rates for the revision for any reason were quite lower because, because we had the dislocations, infections, additional surgery, mainly related to the trochanter, and we have got a very low rate of nerve, nerve plus, pal, palsy um, complications that is different with the published studies. We can comment on this later on. And these are the take-home messages from my presentation. Recognition of local abnormalities is very important. Uh, this surgery requires a, a thorough preoperative planning, no doubt. There are several techniques available. We can argue which is the best. Unfortunately, no RCTs are available. And they are, there is a variety of different implants. However, I will repeat this uh, view that I have got, that the TM caps, trabecular metal caps, and the short conical stems or variants are game changer implants because they have improved our uh, long term outcomes. It is a challenging procedure. However, knowledge ensures satisfactory clinical results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Karahalios, for this uh, great introduction to uh, reconstruction in these very, very challenging cases. Um, I would uh, please welcome uh, Professor George Vabis now, who is a professor and chairman of the Second Orthopedic Department at the Athens <coughs> University School of Medicine. And he is also an adult reconstruction orthopedic trauma specialist. Uh, he has been the chairman of surgical services, services at his hospital and also chairman at the Greek chapter of AO Trauma. Uh, he is a vice chair in a private um, institution as well as the associate editor of uh, HIP International Journal. Professor Vabis. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Mr. Kuti and uh, Peter Boscarinos, and also the Bidic Orthopedic Association. Um, I will talk about uh, femoral reconstruction options in BDH. 
So uh, the proximal femur has a, a spectrum of anomalies, as you can see here, like prior osteotomies, hardware, especially this very bad vitalium that uh, gives me problem all the time to remove. It can be ectatic with distorted canal or uh, uh, remodeling. Uh, it can have a small femoral head, excessive antiversion and cold travalga. Uh, the uh, graded trochanter can be placed posteriorly most of the times, and the canal is twisted, bowed. The diameter in medial lateral is different than the uh, under or posterior, and the isthmus is very narrow. Also, uh, I would like to reiterate that uh, most of the femurs in uh, low and high dislocation, especially in high dislocation cases, are longer than the other ones. So we cannot rely on, uh, a, on AP pelvis x-rays only. So we have to do uh, this uh, uh, long leg uh, x-rays to uh, include the, uh, not to have leg length discrepancy. We can also have valgus knees and LLD due to spinopelvic obliquity. We have to take care of all of these uh, things, including soft tissue abnormalities. George uh, will talk about them uh, later. And, uh, and this is the preoperative planning. You can see very nice x-rays here. <laughs> um, uh, we have to do first clinical examination and, uh, and try to find what is the length, length discrepancy between uh, those two? Uh, it, it's not only uh, the use of long leg standing x-rays that give us the information. We have to do the book test. We have to, uh, to, to, to look at the uh, spine of the patient, etc., etc. And of course, uh, the, we have to do preoperative planning using the uh, AB pelvis and lateral hip uh, 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 taking care, of course, the magnification with a magnification pole. We're using uh, 3D CTs in selected cases as well. So the techniques, we, I, I learned from Professor Hadofilakidis, to whom I was a resident for many years and a, a peer for many years, uh, with proximal shortening and trochaderic osteotomy. But eventually, uh, as you will see, have changed to subtrochanteric osteotomy and distal shortening. When was this appropriate? This is uh, our professor's uh, 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 x-rays with a long follow-up. He was uh, using to tell me, uh, he used to tell me that, uh, uh, George, this is the technique you have to use. Low friction arthroplasty, sunlight like implants and techniques and always cement. But I escaped. So in the past, I favored graded tochander osteotomy in high dislocation that facilitated access to the joint, corrected the alignment of the proximal femur, and advancing of the greater tochander, uh, thus allowing for normal biomechanics and a powerful abductor mechanism. But we had many times difficulties to reduce the hip. The, we had the problems with graded tochander uh, non-union, uh, we sometimes traumatize the abductors by pulling or by releasing them. So, my current strategy is to treat dysplasia as primary. So, it's a different animal the dysplasia, low and high dislocation uh, in our heart of the classification. I always use cementless implants, or most of the time I use cementless implants, and conical fluted stems. I uh, utilize proximal shortening, osteotomy in high dislocation, and distal shortening where it's necessary. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, easy cases, dysplasia, low, uh, uh, low dislocations, treated by uh, normal stems, normal, EE normal, because these stems, as you can see, it has a moderate neck, to, to take care of the high-end version we find sometimes with the femur. This is uh, a normal stems, model stem. So, most of the times now, I, I use the short conical fluted stems uh, called the cone stem, as well as very small 
DDH, especially uh, made for DDH cemented stems. So let's see one case. This is an extremely high DDH with uh, distorted femoral anatomy in both sides. And uh, as you can see, I had to improvise during surgery because no stem was able to insert uh, in this canal. So I did a longitudinal uh, osteotomy just for the stem to get it in and then wrap it with uh, wires. And the left side, I did uh, a cementless cone stem in the right side, a cemented one. So seeing the left side was a very small one, six millimeters thickness that broke. Then I had to revise. So beware of the very small cementless stems, especially when the, uh, the weight of the patient does not allow it. Other very difficult uh, cases, uh, I would like to move on. And then I moved on by uh, using the cone stem, cementless, but with trochanteric osteotomy. I have learned how to do the trochanteric osteotomy and fix these wires. It was a difficult task, but I made it most of the times. But as I, I, as I told you, I, I had some problems with bursitis, I had some problems with the late union or non-union, so I eventually changed. The first time was uh, in this case. This is the high-riding uh, DDH uh, with a great femoral distortion due to uh, due to a prior uh, varus uh, uh, varus osteotomy and. The only thing I could do during surgery is to do an osteotomy and to straighten it. And I used a longer Wagner stem to do that. Big operation, good result. Then I like that. So in other uh, cases like this one, which was a valgus osteotomy for DDH, I did the uh, Again, a longer uh, uh, Wagner stem, but uh, fortunately, there are Wagner stems that are 190 millimeters now, 19 centimeters, which is fairly good length. Again, in this case, this 190 uh, get me out from this very difficult uh, situation. In this one, this was a, a, a patient from uh, Albania, an immigrant. She was wheelchair bound for many years. And I started and I thought, okay, it's just another one uh, DDH. So uh, I tried to do the first one. Very difficult, the very extremely difficult. Even I did five centimeters shortening to reduce this uh, hip. So I did the one, I did the other one, and then a periprosthetic fracture, of course. My life is full of problems. <laughs> this is a previous osteotomy case, very difficult to remove it. It was uh, literally incorporated in the, in, the, in, the, in the bone. So I had to smash everything down and do, actually this looks like a revision, not a primary uh, or a conversion uh, surgery. I use today short cone stems, especially in cases with uh, femoral distortion. As you can see that, I try to, to try to find a way. This is my preoperative planning, and I was so afraid I couldn't do it, but I did it. And cases with uh, femoral osteotomy again, that I, it seemed in the first place that I couldn't do it, it was, uh, this was a, 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 an osteotomy uh, valgus one, but no stem would fit in the preoperative planning. But I tried and navigated. I went uh, far lateral and, and I put it in the valgus position, short conical valgus stem. It was an escape for, for me for this, again, difficult case. <clears throat> I, in, when you do subtrochanteric osteotomy and use small, uh, short conical stems, you must also use uh, additional ORIF. 
Because if you don't, and I, this is my case, eight centimeters uh, shorter, subtrochanteric osteotomy, five centimeters, cup in the real uh, position, and I thought it was okay, but the patient was very happy, started to walk. And then I realized that after shortening, the, dis the medullary canal is dispropionate, uh, the, the proximal being wider, it cannot resist the pull of greater uh, of gluteus medius. So this was, as you can see, a problem. I have to do a secondary RIF. And eight months later, I'm still waiting for union. So I, I got my lessons after all these years. So the short, short variant conical stem, which is a game changer, as Thea told you before, our stage source stems can be placed in any antiversion, is produced in small diameters, has eight rib design to provide good rotational stability, has shown excellent midterm results, and can be used with subtrochanteric osteotomy with additional ORIF fixation. And if you, if you combine this, you can have a good uh, restoration of biomechanics uh, in these difficult hips. The Canada, the Canada group with Alan Gross has shown good results in all three types of hertavilagitis classification using uh, these short Wagner stems, the cone stem as it, as it, is, as it is called. So, I conclude uh, saying that uh, I'm sorry, Professor, late Professor Hertavilagitis, that I, I have abandoned great trochanteric osteotomy. I have abandoned modern neck stems. I use as uh, everyday practice a Wagner short or medium uh, Wagner stem to restore the biomechanics. I do proximal subtrochanteric uh, shortening, uh, that uh, I, I, I always know that it takes a long time to heal and uh, the cone stem needs additional ORIF. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Babis. That was uh, a great uh, insight to femoral reconstruction and its challenges in the three types of uh, heart of Achilles classification for these very complex problems. And finally, we have with us uh, Dr. Jos Meharas uh, to speak to us about preferred approaches, releases, osteotomies, as well as avoiding complications. Uh, Dr. Maharas is a hip and knee surgeon and clinical director at the Henry Dunant Hospital in Athens. He is the past president of the Hellenic Association of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology, as well as past uh, president of the European Hip Society, a member of the International Hip Society, a faculty member of AO Reconstruction, and a past member of the Executive Committee of EFORT, uh, chairman of the EFORT Forum uh, 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 between 2012 and 2021, as well as a visiting professor at the First Orthopedic Department of the University of Athens. Dr. Maharas, the podium is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the British uh, Hip Society for the opportunity uh, to be part of this uh, wonderful panel talking about uh, DDH. And I'm going uh, to uh, talk about uh, approaches, about osteotomies, and give uh, you some cases and my experience on that. I'm not going to spend much about Professor Hartofield, like this has already been done a lot, uh, and uh, technical suggestions you heard uh, by the previous uh, speakers, um, uh, Tio Carhalios and George Bobbis. Um, preferred approaches. Uh, I use posterior approach, but there are reports about Hardin's approach, DDH, and direct lateral. Why I prefer the posterior approach? The familiarity of this approach is a great exposure, easy to extend, easy to handle the soft tissues, and easy to perform trochanteric osteotomy. As uh, I'll show you later on, I prefer to do subtrochanteric osteotomy and can be extended in cases of shortening osteotomies. So it is a great approach. It is, uh, can be used by everyone. I don't want to comment about uh, direct anterior approach dealing with high congenital dislocation cases. That's uh, to me shouldn't be uh, done, should be uh, tried. 
even. Um, so in the approach, you need to choose the one which is uh, easy and you can expose adequately uh, and uh, be able to identify uh, the acetabular uh, wall. And uh, then uh, you start by stitching the external rotators. It's very important uh, to protect the sciatic nerve. And then, of course, as Theophilus has uh, already mentioned, you need to identify the true acetabulum. You need to follow uh, the uh, capsule, the elongated capsule. And uh, remember that the true acetabulum is narrow and shallow and appears hypoplastic. So this is schematically how it looks like. And uh, this, uh, you need to spend some time to recognize this is the false acetabulum, this is the true acetabulum, and it's hypoplastic and there is a bridge between the two acetabula. So when you start rimming, you should protect this. Uh, of course, uh, this, it was, uh, okay, uh, right. Um, what about balancing, about osteotomies, about uh, um, it, do we need the osteotomies or not? So if you, if we have small length, length discrepancies can be managed without shortening osteotomies. But if discrepancies are more than four centimeters, then to my opinion, you should use shortening osteotomies in order to avoid sciatic nerve problems. And as Theophilus has mentioned, uh, the femora is not always equal. And according to this publication, uh, by Kulvar is one third is shorter, one uh, third is equal, but it is one third longer. So about uh, 25 to 30 percent it's longer. What about the sorting osteotomy? What uh, options we have? We have the sequential proximal femoral resection with the greater trochanter osteotomy and um, either cemented or uncemented stems. So originally it was used with cemented stems as Professor Hartofilakidis has introduced. And then uh, there are the metaphysical segment and osteotomies, subtrochanteric shortening osteotomies, and there are different variations and publications about those double several osteotomy, oblique osteotomy and step cut osteotomy. But uh, there are reports about mid-shaft osteotomies and distal femoral osteotomies, especially in cases you need to uh, perform valgus correction. So uh, why I use subtrochanteric osteotomy? Because you can use through the same approach, the posterior approach. It allows the use of uncemented implants. There is no need for trochanteric osteotomy. I never perform trochanteric osteotomy. It's a little bit provocative, but you can discuss later on. I don't believe that you need trochanteric osteotomy and allows for simultaneous derotation um, of excessive femoral underversion. And of course, it uses the risk of uh, neural injury because I mentioned already that if you lengthen more than four centimeters, and especially in cases uh, in which patients have been operated previously, even four centimeters is critical. So uh, it is a little bit um, uh, difficult and you need to be very careful. Of course, uh, the downside is that some guys, they say that you compromise the proximal femoral anatomy, which is not exactly true today. With the modern implants we have, um, the, the coating of the implant is proximal to the osteotomy, and I never had problems uh, with um, this type of osteotomy. Okay, in case you have severe valgus deformities, Theophilus has already mentioned that about 20 to 25 percent of the cases they have valgus um, deformity of the knee, and especially when you bring the, uh, the hip down to the original uh, position of the acetabulum, then the valgus deformity deteriorates after the operation. So you need to keep it in mind and you need to take care of it. Um, so about the section of the proximal femur, the uh, technique Professor Hartofilakidis was using, the femur is cut out, distal the greater trochanter, and then you uh, distally uh, move at the greater trochanter. From sonocyte to uh, ocard? There are reports so, uh, about possible lengthening of up, up to five centimeters. I know that Theophilos is challenging that and still believes that you can do all the cases without shortening osteo me, we can discuss later on. Um, what about the, advan the advantages of uh, the greater trochanter advancement? It is uh, you increase the abductor lever arm, functional length, uh, length of the gluteus medius, and so it is good uh, and safe exposure, but there are disadvantages of the failure of union and abnormal shape femoral canal, and it usually requires cemented stems.
So saprocadetic sorting osteotomies preserves the uh, metaphysial femoral region, and there is no need for great uh, for um, a greater trochanter osteotomy. And as I mentioned, you can do uh, correction of the angular deformity. Is this? It's one of my cases. You see that in the cup I use uh, the uh, monoblock um, TMT cup. Um, this is a case of 25 years of follow-up. Old plates um, with uh, subtrochanteric osteotomy. The use of versus stem. It's an original. It's it's just an ordinary stem. Sometimes the majority of the cases, the femoral canal could be in good shape. So if you have uh, um, uh, ordinary stems, you can use those. And transverse osteotomies, uh, you see how we perform this uh, technique. You do the subtrochanteric area. And as you see around here, there is enough space for uh, the modern stems to be incorporated. And uh, you need to protect your osteotomy. As George Babis has shown, if you do not protect them, and you run into trouble. I use small plates today to do that. And in case you have uh, valgus deformities, I use distal femoral um, osteotomy where you shorten the femur and at the same time you correct the valgus deformity. So high hip center, I'm not going to spend much time because Theo uh, has already spoken, but sometimes it seems it works. And Christo Zulu has published and this on the right hand side is one of my cases um, about 25 years ago. Uh, I put that in high position and that it's the case and it works and it was 25 years later. doesn't mean that this it was a good technique, but I want to say that if you go up there, the bone is not so good, so you need to protect. Um, uh, what about, I'm not going to spend much on that, sorry. And uh, uh, George Bobby's presented some of those cases. This is one of my cases. It is terrible uh, to remove this metal work. Um, because it's adherent to the bone, uh, it's vitalium, uh, the screws uh, break and you need to remove in pieces as you see here and then you need to use a long Wagner stem. I absolutely agree with George Bobbis on that. It's a great uh, stem and you can correct uh, the deformities and you have a great result. So some of the osteotomies I'm going to show you, I have I use always the subtrochanteric uh, osteotomy and the distal femoral osteotomy. I have used all the techniques. This is an oblique subtrochanteric osteotomy with a small plate, unicortical screws and uh, uh, this, it is uh, distal femoral osteotomy, uh, valgus deformity at that time, 25 years ago, I used the monoblock cap uh, with some screws to protect and keep in good position and the old fashioned uh, plates at that time, we didn't have this um, unicortical uh, plates, but you see it is excellent fixation and a union of the uh, osteotomy. This is another case, a valgus um, the deformity of the knee. And uh, today I use this technique with um, uh, this um, supracondylar uh, plates from AO. They offer great stability and a great result in the same operation. You deal with both deformities because I mentioned that once you bring down the, hand, the, the center of rotation, uh, the valgus deformity deteriorates. And some other cases are this is uh, again TMT monoblock cap. Uh, it is long term. Uh, again, uh, another uh, case. I always use this small seven hole plates uh, for derotation um, uh, protection. And of course, they give some extra stability because otherwise you could have problems. I never had any uh, pseudartrosis or non union of the subtrochanteric osteotomy. So um, let's talk about complications. Of course, if you operate, you have complications and you can uh, be in trouble in the acetabular side. You can have wall perforation. That means you can go into the pelvis. As Theo mentioned, you need to preserve the periosteum because it helps you. Uh, to regenerate the bone, especially the bone graft. And uh, sometimes you uh, violate the anterior wall, which is not good. You need to be careful because the anterior wall is uh, very thin 
and uh, you could have fractures, both walls, but um, mainly the anterior wall and uh, superior wall violation. I mentioned already the bridge between the two acetabular and uh, the femoral side, proximal femoral fracture. You need to protect your fragment. You need to put protective circlas wires to protect if you perform osteotomy. You, some, if you are not careful, you can perforate the femoral canal. You can have trochanteric, um, greater trochanter fracture or trochanteric non-union because uh, not all of us, we are experts as Professor Karthofilakidis and the old fashioned guys with a trochanteric osteotomy. Today, not many orthopedic surgeons are good enough to um, fix the greater trochanter after the osteotomy. And of course, you could have sciatic nerve injury either by over lengthening or um, because of your instruments. And if you have laborious operation, you could have heterotopic ossification. So you need to be careful. You need to have a plan and uh, you should be careful. This is uh, one of my cases. Uh, you see that uh, it was a little bit laborious at uh, the stem. It is an ordinary stem, the cup. I tried to fix that, but um, some of the bone grafts around there, heterotopic ossification. The other side, again, the trochanteric osteotomy, non well fixed. Uh, the cup was excellent, but um, the femoral side and the trochanteric osteotomy, non well fixed. So you need to be careful. You need to use a logger plate like George Babis has shown. So every one of us, um, had complication and we learn our lessons. So uh, trabecular metal, it is an excellent material. I use a lot of monoblock caps in the past. So my suggestion is to spend time uh, to have a clinical examination of the patient. You need to understand uh, the anatomy and uh, you need to pay attention to the lumbar spine because sometimes they do have fixed deformities of the lumbar spine. I use posterior approach. I use cementless components and uh, I insert the uh, acetabular in the true acetabular position. I never do uh, trochanteric osteotomy. I use cotyloplasty when it's appropriate and I use transverse subtrochanteric osteotomy with um, a small plate. So uh, you need to equalize the, the length, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, professors. Uh, that was an excellent session. It's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been a, a lot of learning for all of us. So we're just looking and see if there's any questions. Um, I, Petros, I guess you want to start off and then we can, I can also join in and then Dominic can also join in. Certainly. Um, I have a question for uh, Prof. Karahayos to start with. Thank you again, uh, all, all speakers, for, for your contributions today. Um, Prof. Karahayos, I want to ask you, um, you had a publication with Prof. Hartofilakidis in 2013 at the BJJ, where you published your 20 to 32 year survival results on the impaction grafting technique for the cotyloplasty uh, technique for both low and high dislocation. In that paper, you showed that the probability of survival at 10 years of hips with low dislocation was higher than those in with high dislocation, while at further follow-up, this changes and the survival with the high dislocation seems to be a bit higher. Uh, how do you explain this dichotomy? Listen, you have to understand the type of implants we, they were using during this period of time. And as I told you before, uh, with um, high dislocation, uh, the caps did better, and with low dislocation, the stems did better. And it was obvious that there was an implant effect on this. It was not just the techniques, but the, they were the available implants. As I show you later, we haven't published now. We have we have uh, um, uh, we have written the paper. It's ready for submission. That using modern implants with pretty similar techniques, uh, we have got uh, equal uh, equal uh, uh, survival satisfactory survival rates long term uh, when it comes to a septic loosening as an end point. But things uh, for all operations or for um, revisions for all reasons, 
they are go just above uh, 90 percent because you know all this type of surgery has got uh, complications it's not like uh, i haven't shown you i haven't shown you results from the dysplastic group because uh, with the modern implants the techniques that, that we know uh, they are pretty similar with the primary uh, total hip arthroplasties you get the eventual infection it's very rare uh, dislocations but uh, the, the results pretty the same thank you very much uh, do we have yeah professor macaris could i ask you you said you used to use monoblock cups you no longer use them or you moved on to modular they don't exist anymore because the company was bought by Zimmer. It was the Implex originally, the original TMT cup. It was a monoblock, excellent cup. I have 100% survival. I never revised any of those. But today I use the Continuum, which is uh, the modular uh, thing, and it has the possibility to put some screws. Um, the monoblock had the possibility to put screws in the periphery, as I have shown, but this, it was a great material, great material. A shame, because uh, I've seen you do that, and uh, the fixation was fantastic. So, was the, mo the monoblock ones, was that a fixed diameter on the inside? It was 28, yes. It was 28, and the beauty of this, it was that the monoblock, it had an elasticity pretty close to the bone, and just because the poly was molded into the metal shell, even the small diameter cups, they had thick poly, and this is the reason they survived, because the poly was molded and was penetrating the TMT, uh, and the whole thing, it was elastic and it was thick the thickness of the poly was uh, more than six seven uh, millimeters and so this is one of the reasons uh, they have survived i i believe that the same results has teo as well and just because patients were young now they are up to 25 years follow-up and non-revisions uh, uh, professor Karkolos? yes i would like to confirm this uh, comment uh, of course, not 100% survival of them because uh, because we had uh, two infections, one dislocation needed a revision. It was a unique cup. I don't also know why the Americans, they change it because in North America, they like the modular stuff, uh, especially for congenital hip disease for the dimensions of 34 to 40, 42. There, were, there was also um, this cup was available for 22 millimeters. And it was quite uh, help helpful. I think that one of the reasons that it has uh, it had a great success was that there was no uh, backside wear uh, with the uh, conventional polyethylene because uh, the, all these they were not uh, cross-link polyethylenes; they were uh, conventional polyethylenes. And but due to the fact that there was not backside wear, <clears throat> there was no uh, locking mechanism for these caps. They had excellent results. Thank you. Uh, Dominic? Um, yes, um, I noticed that for your sub truck and teric osteotomies, you tended to use cementless implants generally, with particularly cones. Um, have any of any experience of using cemented implants uh, with that? Or do you have any opinion on that? No, yeah, I, 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 I have a strong opinion. Sorry, <laughs> we are different because cement can extrude through the osteotomy and then prevent from uh, bone union. So I was, uh, I, I'm scared to do cement in this case. I'm, I'm, I'm not scared, but there is no need for the cement. Uh, it is unbelievable uh, the results with the modern stems. So you do the subtrochaderic shortening osteotomy. You protect your osteotomy with a small plate. Today we have the technology and the possibility. Seven whole plates. Uh, you fix that. Unicortical screws. And as you load the patients, then it is protected from rotational deformities and is compressed and it, it heals. It is it's very good. And do you have any um, thoughts on doing interoperative uh, nerve measurements for the, do you, if you're doing a, um, a lengthening rather than doing a subtrochanteric? Do you do you use that interoperatively to look at the sciatic nerve? 
You can do that, but by using posterior approach, you can evaluate the tension of the of the sciatic nerve. You see that you protect with the rotators. But I'm very careful uh, when I operate patients previously operated. They have scar tissue, and this scar tissue deteriorates the results. So I'm very careful. I wouldn't mind if it is uh, six, seven, eight centimeters shortening, and you bring it down. Uh, they uh, behave much better, the sciatic nerves, rather having something like uh, three and a half to five centimeters with previous osteotomy where there is scarring there. So yeah. in those cases, you need to be very careful. And if you have monitoring, it, it improves, it helps, but uh, it's not always available. Uh, in, uh, I so don't use that, it, but uh, I, I know that uh, some guys, they do use it. The ones that are tethered is where you would consider it. Yeah, sure. Apocadericus yeah. is protective for the nerve also. Yeah. It's very protective. Uh, for the caracolus? Yes, I follow a different uh, technique. Uh, first of all, I separate the patients to those that they had no previous surgery, the native hips, and those that they have got. Because for those that they have got previous surgery, failed surgery in childhood, this is a different, completely different group. Over there, I'm very conscious about the nerve, the scars, and I think that most of them, they require subtrochanteric osteotum. Now, if it comes to native hips uh, with low dislocation and high dislocation, I, I have this preoperative planning, and I know if there is a case of a longer femur. It's 20 to 30%. And I know the exact difference. Now, if, if, the, if the disease is bilateral, I don't want to go in detail how we manage it. Then we start with a Chevron uh, type of trochanteric osteotomy, Chevron, keeping, uh, paying attention to maintain a continuous sleeve between the vastus uh, lateralis and the gluteus medius. And this type of uh, osteotomy, osteotomy has minimal uh, complications. Now, the most of the, of the hips that they have got, they, they don't have longer femurs. It's easy to relocate. Plus the 360 degrees of soft tissue. For those, for those, um, femurs that they are longer, we go uh, in the mid diaphysis, uh, to perform an equal degree uh, of the discrepancy, uh, removal of a cylinder because I didn't want to interrupt the proximal femoral, uh, the proximal femoral uh, morphology. I, I, I think that if you perform any kind of osteotomy using either, <coughs> either cementless or cemented implants, you can potentially jeopardize the, the stability. Others, they have a different view about this. And George, you know, disagree with this. Now, in the cases that you have got a combination with a valgus uh, a, a valgus uh, knee deformity. I go in one stage and I perform the mid diaphysis and the valgus osteotomy in the same uh, time. Inside, in, in this way, and I, what I would like to stress is to know during from your preoperative planning that there is the longer femur. These ones, they, they create the major problems with the nerves. With the rest of them, following this technique, our nerve injuries uh, transient, uh, transient pulses are uh, really minimal. For this reason, I don't go um, for this um, uh, four, four centimeters difference uh, limit that it exists in, in the literature because we don't see it in our um, uh, series. Uh, we perform less uh, less osteotomies, but uh, with this type of indications and uh, procedure, as I told you before. Was it Macris? I want to be a little bit provocative because I don't know who is really violating uh, the proximal femur, the one who is doing the osteotomy close to the lesser trochanter and uh, releases 180, 360 degrees, all the soft tissue, or just doing a cut um, just an osteotomy about three centimeters uh, below the less trochanter to, uh, and then you have a lot a big chunk of bone with the metaphysis intact and um, 
Uh, I know that uh, Theo has done a great uh, work and he has published a lot and I fully respect what he's doing. But in my hands, I do not um, do even uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 tenotomies. I mean, usually once you perform subtracadetic osteotomy, you can reduce, you don't need to do a lot of releases and you protect uh, very well the, the, the abductors. What happened? I, Sorry, any, no questions in the chat as of now. Uh, any other questions uh, from uh, Petros or Dominic? Um, I had a question for George Babis, which uh, I think he answered very eloquently during his talk about the trochanteric osteotomy and whether it still has a place. Um, I wanted to ask instead, um, have you ever found the need to use custom-made stems for any of these cases? Do you think there is a place for them? Um, <clears throat> As you see, none of, none of us is using custom-made stems because they are very, very expensive. They take time to, to have them, takes time to have them and, until they are produced. And of course, they are produced uh, in a way that we, don't, we, we cannot control. You know, Professor Xenakis from Ioannina has used many times uh, 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 these stems but even though uh, I, I don't believe in them, I, I don't think that the literature uh, favors the stems uh, instead of these uh, fantastic cone stems that are in our hands every day. Thank you. The custom-made stems, sorry to interrupt, to add to George Bobbis, it's absolutely correct what he says. I work with Professor Xenakis and I spent a few years when he was organizing the hip week in Ioannina. But this, it was a special type of, of, of uh, cases with deformities of the proximal femur. You need to order the rasps, you need to order the stems. Of course, he has published good results, but again, you maintain the abnormality the proximal femur has. Some of those implants, they failed, and still you have the problem with the discrepancy. Uh, if you have high congenital dislocation cases, doesn't work this technique. He was doing those in deformities of the proximal femur. Uh, Professor Karakalis? Yes, I, I would like to, my reply to this is similar to George Babbage. I rarely uh, use, I feel I have the need to, for a custom-made implant. I have used three of them only in two doors in Greece and another one in uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain. All of them, they had other problems. They, they, they were um, uh, disorders, uh, skeletic disorders. Uh, and they had very small uh, dimensions. But again, uh, be aware that very small dimensions and very small custom-made implants are susceptible to mechanical failure, structural failure. You have already, or you have always to uh, balance, to make a balanced decision related to the BMI and the uh, activity demand of uh, these patients. But very rarely for me. Okay. Thank you. Petros, uh, uh, sorry, can, can I uh, really catch up with a different thing? Today in Greece, we do not have so many cases as the, we had in the past because of the great work of the pediatricians. And the cases we operate, all of us, they are coming from uh, guys, from ladies, uh, coming from the neighbor countries, uh, financial immigrant patients uh, come from Albania, from Romania, from Armenia, from Georgia, or even from Syria. Uh, in Greece, we don't have any more. I mean, I don't know what uh, Theo and George uh, believe, but today, Greek patients are very rare with this disease. So yes, I think it's a very important point. Um, this is uh, a less encountered, less frequently encountered condition, absolutely. Well, probably we're, we're the last <laughs> yeah, we can't really. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I'm doing the revision now of the DDH case. This is another story, very different, very different and more difficult. May I make a comment to this? Uh, 
this is a congenital hip disease. It's congenital. The, the patients are there. However, the screening, the neonatal screening with ultrasound has changed the evolution, the evolution of the natural history. Sorry, the correct, uh, correct word is the natural history of disease. And now we, we see very few new cases, neglected patients at the age of 35, 40 years old, but we see failed surgery in childhood. This is the, the major problem. And each of these cases is a unique problem. And these are, they have the most complications in our hands in our days. But uh, the, uh, the, the numbers are going down. And uh, I fully appreciate what uh, George Babi said, that per perhaps uh, the people that they will replace us in, in the departments, they will not be very happy with uh, these cases to proceed and sort out the, the problems because, because they don't get the wide exposure uh, we get, we got in the past, uh, and the techniques are uh, irrelevant. New implants that they, it's there, accumulated experiences, but they don't. They, the young surgeons they don't get the uh, wide exposure with big numbers of cases. Okay. I think uh, last uh, from uh, Professor Panagoulos. Yeah, just uh, to, to to continue with this that uh, George uh, Babi said that uh, we see more and more now revisions. And uh, these revisions, they have a significant, especially uh, as a tabular defects. In these cases, uh, we had to use in some of these cases, uh, I mean, the only solution is the custom-made or 3D printed implants for the acetabular side. So I will agree with George that uh, uh, for us now, this is the most challenging, the revision of uh, congenital hip dislocation failed total hip arthroplasty. I think we should have another webinar for that in the future. Yes. Uh, on, on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for participating and uh, in this fantastic webinar. Can I pass on to Dominic for the for final words? Well, indeed, well, I'd like to thank all the faculty and Petros and Satish for providing a fantastic series of presentations there on dysplasia of the hip and that active discussion. I hope the interactions may extend to actually meeting in real life, perhaps, uh, for collaboration and work, but as you pointed out, perhaps also socially as well. Uh, finally, please watch your emails and Twitter accounts for the next global webinar. And thank you very much to all who joined. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank much. You very much, Dominique. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. It was thank great. You, Petros. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you, Petros. Thank you, Dr. Kuti. Thank you.